of butterflies. Zhang Zi said, the man does not know if he dreams of a butterfly or if the butterfly dreams of a man. It is unclear who awakens first or from where. Neither do I know after all these years if I am a Chinese girl who wanted to go home <coughs> or a woman from Hong Kong who will stay in England. It's British summertime in my living room, but my watch in my drawer moves seven hours ahead. The past. Is the door still open? The future. Am I a filial daughter living so far away from my parents? Wearing her marmalade camouflage, the butterfly of unknowing pollinates in one world, then in another. Maria, in your home, I only perspire. When I move about from room to room, dusting the shelves, shaking the pillows, watering the plants, I am a mindful ghost you don't notice. Each morning when I bring Hazel to school at 7.40 a.m., I feel the brunt of my conscience, her trusting eyes, her well-ironed uniform, the words she can spell. Then there is hazel across the ocean, in the country of mango trees. The hazel I have not hugged for months and months. Her school in San Fernando that I knew nothing of. Some days when no one is in, I gauge the weight of the house key in my pocket. Think of how much I knew, your every single routine. All the silver photo frames on the shelf. I look out of the window so spick and span at the view of the harbour and the green hills I cannot afford. I set down the bags of vegetables and meats from the market. This evening, I will make you stir fry rice, some choice and green and red carrot soup with pork. As steam rises from the rice cooker and the aroma of the soup fills the air, I try to dream back my own daughter into being. Last time I saw her was in spring, and she told me her best friend is called Angel. She wanted a bob hairstyle. Um, and um, talking about daughter, so it's time for me to talk about um, what happened in Hong Kong. Um, truths, truths 2.0, incoming. I smell tear gas everywhere. Imagine there are no countries. Once upon a time, I lived in a place where the metro was never late. Everything ran like clockwork, and it was so safe you could walk to Choi Wa for a bowl of wonton noodles at midnight. There's no word in the dictionary for this. Someone said to me, young people are the same all over the world. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell. Since June, my screen time has increased by 150%. I go to the news as soon as I wake up and right before going to sleep, concerned something might break out again when I'm out in the supermarket or picking up my daughter. I think of my former boss, a very wise woman. If she were here, she would know what to do. Karen's advice, stop torturing yourself. Think of your parents. Think of how much you love them. Smell that fear. Incoming, let's not give up goodness. It is in real danger. A mosaic of dreamers despite the rain, despite the heavy rain. Yan Jai Zhou. King Jai Hong. The world will never forget. For it's a nation I shall make of them with a flag and an anthem and a standing army. I'll treat with the Viceroy on equal terms and other kings and princes. And when I've accomplished what I set out to do, I'll stand one day before the Queen 
not kneel, mind you, but stand like an equal. And she'll say, I'd like you to accept the order of the garter as a mark of my esteem, cousin. And she'll pin it on me herself. Oh, it's big. It's big, I tell you. 61. A jolly in the subcontinent. 61.1. When the subcontinent was ours, 61.2. No, theirs. 61.2.1. To be jollied. 62. Two mad dog Englishmen, short on high Victorian imperial boredom, long on chutzpah and capers. 62.1. Smuggle some guns into some country. 62.1.1. The Kafiristan job. 62.2. Then some cunning, some chance, some shooting. 62.3. And one of them ends up running the show. 62.4. The locals reckon he's the son, and they all start bowing down to him. 62.4.1. Just like that. 63. And you thought, wouldn't that be bloody cool? Well, not just to be Sean Connery. Obviously, that would be bloody cool. But, you know, it'd also be cool to just control someone. Especially if somewhere when you felt that you've never fitted in wherever the where is you're from. And then have loads of people suddenly decide that, yes, despite the fact that you look different, sound different, talk different, and scared them with your guns and what have you, still, you're a better bet than that current fattener bob they have, who goes around taking their bread from them, their grain from them their money from them, taking their wives and daughters from them whenever he fancies, with only a little bit of prompting and cajoling, a twinkling smile or two which they understand even if they don't understand what the smile is saying. They take that and the guns and the weapons and the drill and the tactics and the confidence you've given them, and they surround the Fatna Bob's palace in a ring of chanting, heaving, determined bodies, which won't shift. And if he tried to sneak through, he'd get sucked into a moor of flesh, like being sucked into a whirlpool. So the Nabob's got no other choice to throw his crown, to give in and throw his hands up, throw his crown up, his queen up. And when he looks round at who to give them to, so he isn't torn into pieces the size of stamps with his fat head on them, and the crowd are growling and shuffling and getting ready to start pitching sharp things at him. It's only when he looks at you with the crown in one hand and an imploring gesture being made by the other and his eyes are watery and pleading and hopeful and hopeless and scared and the crowd suddenly hush as they see where he's looking and you suddenly feel your arm lifting and your hand reaching out and you gently trace the band of the crown once round to make sure it's real and then you close the whole of your hand around it with a jerk and look at it in the same way you looked at her when she slowly undressed that night in your room and then before anyone can do anything take anything away you put the crown on your head pretending you're not being reverential but you are a bit trying to be that cocky and cool person that all the people down there have been inspired by and now should be slightly scared of and then this there's this moment of pure utter silence like you get at 4am when everything is still or dead and then you're almost blown back by this gust of noise, this rush of love and fear and hope and expectations and dreams all in this one blast, this one expansion of emotion. 64. Yeah, that'd be cool. 64.1. Yeah, that'd be fucking cool. So then... Yeah, the book continues in that in that way and that vein. And it, um, I won't spoil the ending for you, but you can imagine that um, going to a war zone, setting up your own country, um, is not necessarily something that um, people would welcome. So it has a um, an inevitable movement, so shall we say? Um, but there's lots in it as well about. Um, 
the whole stuff around people who start their own countries. There's a whole set of um, places called micronations where people have tired of the tax regime or in some way have felt that they are in dispute with the local government or are, you know, are trying to prove that they are some sort of lord or some sort of king themselves and they declare their own country. And you know, I actually pillaged the rough guide to micronations for a lot of the stuff that you need yeah, the actual bits and pieces if you want to start your own country because you don't actually need much. Now, it doesn't necessarily end well, but you don't actually need much to, to go and do so. Um, I've just shared the link for the book if you're interested and plus, you know, merchandise as well to try and throw that in. Um, let me jump back to for a bit. Um, just to say, yeah, I, you know, Ticket Tape's book is not as obsessed with hybrid identities although there is a strand of it there what it's far more concerned with is the idea of urban living and almost in a sense of the you know how one lives in in a city and how one finds one's way there but yeah of course it's difficult you know as Jenny referenced you know London as a city where there is so many people there's a multiplicity of people and yeah there aren't actually that many quote unquote true native Londoners. I am a true native Londoner, but I can say that to someone and someone will raise their eyebrows and go, really? I didn't think Londoners look like you. So yeah, it's interesting to you know, navigate those sorts of things. And there are a couple of poems in the book that um, sort of speak to that and speak to my very strong sense that I am British, not English, which is of course an interesting, you know, thing to unpack in of itself because the British identity is not necessarily as was not um, predicated on the idea of being hybrid. But of course, there are initially at least four other identities within the British identity, even before you start to think about what else the empire has brought in and brought out as well. Which was a very you know, long winded way of trying to explore this in a five line poem called the problem of becoming English. The problem of becoming English wasn't, as I was supposing, of whether the ethnicity would accept my race, but rather one of posing in a top hat for publicity. Um, is it gone? Where is it gone? Um, I, I explore things to slightly more depth in this poem, though, um, which, um, you, know, uh, you know, summer of 2016, you know, lots of people were writing refugee poems about what was going on, you know, in the Mediterranean at the time. And of course, you know, I found that I couldn't write that sort of poem without some of um, my view of my identity, you know, coming into the poem as well. It's called Risk Patterns. One. I'm hearing that foxes are feeling put out. The chickens are... Sorry, let me start that again. One. I'm hearing that foxes are feeling put out. The chickens are gathering in chicken-only meetings, discussing how fox violence makes them feel. Two. We like the idea of the South until it knocks on our door. Three, who is surprised that people want to claim the joys of being exotic, but none of the pain of being different? Four, the thing that really pulled me up, half the country has fled, 50% gone in less than two years. Did all of them choose to do that? Is it actually a choice when someone shoves a gun in your face and says, Go. Five. White a man, white a man, does whatever a hegemonic culture lets him get away with, frankly. Six. All those brown people quietly condoning terrorism. So unlike all those white people loudly condemning racism. Oh. Seven. You know we're an island, right? How do you think most people got here first? They didn't fall from 
the tree is or spring up fully formed from the heather, some sort of sea crossing may have been involved. Eight. There'll never be much compassion in this debate. How can there be when we've, we, look how I accept it, have done a lot of invading and rarely been invaded? Deep down, what we're expressing is the exasperation that those chaps over there couldn't make a better go of defending themselves against their others, unlike us. Nine. I have a recurring dream in which I stand on the table at the dinner party I'm attending, say, I'm an immigration jihadist. Let them all in. Let's start the throw open all the doors party. I wake up and silently chide myself for being braver asleep than awake. 10. I am an expat. You are a refugee. They are a migrant. 11. Naming the programme Mare Nostrum. Fucking cheek. It's their C2. 12. You know the continent is ageing rapidly. Dying, in fact. Who do you think is going to come and look after your parents, seeing as you don't do extended families? And this is the welcome you give to people who will be keeping your show on the road? 13. Refuge is not just a place of it's not just a place, it's a state of mind, a state of hope. Fourteen. I've already won the lottery. I have a British passport. Thank you. Um and I shall take my leave um if I may with this, if I can find it. Um simply because it's, um, where's it gone? Um, because it comes from a video um, that I saw um, about something that I like very much, which is neon and neon making. And the video happened to be filmed in Hong Kong. And so I thought that might be a nice way to round stuff off. It's called The Last, the Last Neon Sign Maker in Hong Kong. Oh. His hands flutter by the five tongues of flame, joints articulating at 800 degrees Celsius, lips blowing commercial wishes down glass tubes, speaking of honest scripts for certain characters, light heads bending, swirling, inflating. Thousand layer paper slides in to protect the messages before chicken intestines shake hands with neon breath. It's the night iron hearts for a brighter light. Without displays of prosperity, my city is a ghost town. If you're feeling blue, the answer is argon, he says, but best is daylight red. A door above an aircon unit glows rainbow ready, the past slipping out. He, inha he inhales the urban gas one last time. Thank you very much. Oh. That was absolutely wonderful and a great way to finish, Rishi. Can we all please give him a big round of applause? Wow, I, I really can't wait to get my hands on Saffron Jack. I think there's a lot of interesting things that you've mentioned there, particularly the idea of micronations and as well the, the yeah. kind of play on Kipling. So yeah, if anyone's thinking of creating their own nation state, um, please get your hands on Saffron Jack as well. <laughs> just the hotel room lighting here anyway i'm going to read a few poems from the hummingbird sometimes flies backwards and for me i guess this idea of a hyphenated identity has very much to do um with the idea of of being considered a foreigner and also with the f the feeling of being not always feeling that you belong or perhaps not always feeling that you're welcome. Uh, first poem is uh, a poem from a few years ago. Uh, my wife and I were not married. We had been a couple for only uh, about three or four months 
when I left Mexico and took a teaching job in mainland China. And we spent a year as a long distance couple before we married and moved together to Hong Kong. So this is from that time. Uh, there's a Mandarin word in here in my apologies in advance to Mandarin speakers for my pronunciation. Te extraño. Te extraño, I say, because I don't have enough words in the language of your country to say all that I mean. I say I miss you because I don't have enough words in the language of my country to name the waking slumber that is my life without you. I say wo xiang ne because I don't have enough words in the language of this new country to break the great walls of sadness or cross the ocean of emptiness when you are gone. I say I miss you every day because how else to say I mourn that part of me that seems to die when you are gone because the best of me only wakes when you are here. I say I miss you because I am a fool, because you never left, because I feel your love each day here inside me, making me strong enough to bear my missing you. Second poem I'll read is, uh, thank you, Sam. <laughs> uh, this is a uh, part one of a long poem, try to get it in the, hey, there's the book. Part one of a long 10 page poem called In Ruins is uh, a poem called No Foreign Objects. Uh, there's a reference to Odysseus for anyone who doesn't recall. Uh, Odysseus was unable to go home for 10 years because of his argument with Poseidon. And he finally had to make peace with Poseidon by making a monument to Poseidon in an inland place where they did not know the sea. So that's the reference. Part one, no foreign objects. Unlike us, a pencil, a wristwatch, a cup, even Odysseus ore planted upright in the earth. No thing is truly foreign left in any country long enough Objects pull on their coats of dust with perfect equanimity. Time is the currency with which an object buys a place. In a country where no one salts their meat, Odysseus ore has weathered and been bleached in turn by rain and sun. The ore, unknown by that name, does not miss the sea. Here it is the measure of snow, silent witness, and everyone's memory of fierce, unforgiving Januaries. And what of us, whom no amount of time or dust can release from stubborn individuality, or unfold in warm arms of belonging, exiles, transplants, foreigners. Home was not a room to simply close a door and walk away from, and the path we are on will never take us there again. Uh, this poem has a fair amount of Spanish words in it. Uh, my apologies to the non-Spanish speakers. I, I don't think you'll suffer from not knowing any of them except uh, at the end of the poem, the word contigo in Spanish means uh, with you. When I, I was first introduced to my wife by a mutual friend for language practice. My wife wanted to practice English with a native speaker and I uh, needed to practice Spanish with a native speaker. And for many, many months, I, I was smitten with her, uh, but thought she was out of my league. Uh, I felt uh, she became for me my, my unattainable woman, my, my Beatrice. So this poem begins with a, a reference to Dante, and I refer in the poem to Beatrice. The, the epigraph from Dante, uh, Incipit Vita Nova, now begins the new life. Questions of translation, part one, rules of grammar, I am. 
What is wrong with me, Beatrice? I still confuse soy, which means I am, with estoy, which means I am. To better remember the rule, I type this note. Soy is for the permanent condition, but the iPhone auto translate function turns it into soy sauce is for the permanent condition. Soy confundido. No, Beatrice corrects me. Estoy confundido. Soy es para la condición permanente. Estoy es por la condición temporal. But Beatrice, what if I am always confused? Part two, when you translate. Beatrice, when you translate the small book of my life, please do it backwards. Starting with a big happy funeral, everyone drinking and recalling happy times and noting how lovely you look in black. In the middle, there will be much laughter, some adventures and achievements, but more misadventures, mistakes, and misunderstandings. I've said too much already of childhood and snow and cold that never ends. Say no more of it here. Boaz, once among the Eskimo, thought the Inuit language had 50 words for snow. How many words have we for pain? Dolor, sufrimiento, pena, parents, Catholic school, final exam, and ache, and fail, and love, and X. Be wary of the dark, spongy chapters, dripping tears. I once fell into a deep, deep well of memories and almost drowned there. And when you find and translate those passages sparkling with a pure joy like blinding winter sun reflected on new snow, I hope that in your language, in your voice, those brief happy moments of a past life become more musical and longer with every page you turn. Part three, how to say. I know that beso is the word for kiss and ends with O, a sound which forms the lips into a perfect circle of itself. Beatrice, como se dice? I know that te quiero means I like you or I want you or I love you. I know that quiero contains the key to unlock many secrets. Como se dice, I know that when I say la curva perfecta de su espalda, somehow my Spanish fails to express the perfection that I see. Como se dice, how do I translate the look in your sparkling eyes into kisses and the rising, falling, rising tone of your laughter into love? Como se dice, how to say, I am a happy man. Beatrice, I think it begins contigo. Uh, next, I'll read a, two excerpts from a long poem called A Handful of Idiots. These are the poems in my book which most directly reference my, my rural childhood in, in farm country and my, my sense that I didn't fit in there. Uh, a Handful of Idiots, part four. A poet. Who among us does not burn like the poet exiled in a foreign land to be heard? to be recognized at last for who we are, understood. The idiot and the holy man both sit hours without speaking, indifferent like the hammer to the saw. Each works in their own way. Yet the wood, wanting nothing and no one, the wood waits for whatever is next. Part five, a traveler. Like the thumb among the fingers, the idiot stands the furthest apart, the furthest apart from us all to show us, teach us that for all the distance, the separateness, however alone and apart we may be, there is none so far that he cannot come home 
be embraced and find his own natural voice now restored to him and sing in common the songs of his own village. Part of our identity. Um, so I thought I would read a food poem and I can see that Sean's on, on this um, in the audience. And actually I did this on a course with Sean. Sean writes brilliant food poems. So just, just to mention that. Um, it's called Chicken. Appa said there was no refrigerator when he grew up. If you didn't eat it quickly, all at once, it went bad. Or worse, someone else ate it. But mother was going to ration it the whole week, sliced in sandwiches, saving for dinner the carcass, bones picked clean, ready for soup. How could he be a mouth always open, the emptied plate between them? How could she be a cupboard always locked? This is England, 1983. I'm home from school. So a, a lot of poems in this um, pamphlet are, are haunted by all sorts of things. Um, family stories, Chiu Chiu, which is for me um, always in the background. Um, and I know so there are some literal ghost stories. So this one is um, based on a number of family ghost stories. Haunts. One, Lama believes the dead cling to their possessions. My dress is red shantung. Its last occupant is heartbroken and tugging on my hem. The widower holds me at arm's length, cold and stiff. I waltz around, around. When I sink down, a white hand strokes my feet, smearing black blood over my cracked heels. Two. Our Jack visited that night, breath stinking of arak. Those black brogues, give them back. Five daughters, many school shoes. There wasn't enough money to buy brand new. Shoes taken off, gather dust and ash. Our Jack wears loafers, a paper suit. Three. In his office of black scrolls, Yama reads out the sentence. I repudiate, not me. I dispute until dawn. Sticky rice, I'll harvest next time. His ink stain index traces down the night's ledger and I'm slammed awake. Next door, someone is crying. Open fingers, palms up. In the first hand, red silk cord, a thin white braid of hair. In the second, an egg. Um, the next poem I'm going to read um, repeats a Chiu Chiu phrase, which uh, means something roughly like, I want to tell you something, or there's something I want to talk to you about. Swallow. Grammars gather on power lines. Verbs twitter in the mangifera. I roost in humid shade overeating from the dictionary. Nouns sticky as langzat, a kilo of adjuncts, a catty of adverbs. Wa ai kat le ta jie da wei. Oritund, nobiety, opaque, smeezling, destitute, spoilage. Wa ai kat le ta jie da wei. Minatory, plangent, deliquesce. Lutilant, sportive, crackle. The words I swallow become feathers poking through my skin. I am fledging for the migration. A window yawns, a line of lipstick, palms reddening the horizon. Um, 
when I was growing up, my father ran a field study station. He um, was a zoologist teaching at the university. Um, and we had a, a lot of really happy times there. Um, so a lot of my identity is also linked into being a, a daughter of scientists. And, you know, I'm not a scientist now. And, and I do a profession that my father really approves of, you know. Being an accountant's a good thing, right, as a, a Chinese daughter. Um, but, but I have these really fond memories of this kind of wild childhood that we had um, in this forest station. The poem, the title of the poem is actually the name of the place. Gomma. Wet greeted us everywhere. Its green mossiness, earthy and insinuating between flip-flop and feet. Woody drips from the dark canopy, squelching leaf litter. It licked us along the dark corridor, skidding from concrete kitchen onto long veranda and down the steep slope to that sudden sunlit padang and beyond, flowing glints, clean water, swift, and there she was. Sungai, Kaka, capricious sister. She sprayed us with sweet stream scent, skirted soft sandstone, rocks slippery, shoulders undercutting earth banks. Her spirits altered after the rains, waking on us. She grumbled gravel, grumpy at being rust rushed, bearing the load of overlogging, heavy sediment from up valley deforestation. Our old white ford was a rhino, turning reluctantly out of the gate. Its lurch lumber expelled me from forest home to other study stations. Tear blind, feeling sick, evicted, I looked back to the red roofed refuge of crashed out lorrymen, its altar offering oranges and incense, the giant banyan with roots upwards, branches hunched over, weeping. And, you know, so many of us are, are kind of in the diaspora, we're away from the places that we were born. Um, and, and I guess I don't, particularly for me, I guess the idea of home is very problematic. Um, it's a place that um, in Malaysia, you know, they refer to people who aren't um, ethnically categorized as Malay, as Bumiputra, You're, you, you never, that is never your land. You, know, you are described as being from somewhere else. Um, and this this pamphlet, I kind of put put it together as um, Britain moved out of, um, started doing the journey of Brexit. And I suddenly thought, um, you know, do I belong here? Do I belong in Britain? Because I took British citizenship, have passport, you know, in, in the same way as, as Rishi's poem refers to. I felt like, you know, I got that British passport and I got kind of entrance into Europe. And, and suddenly, you know, all of those things came into kind of stark contrast and an, in Britain right now, there's quite a lot of um, anti-East Asian feeling, um, as there is in the States um, because of the media coverage of COVID. Um, and and I, it's just, it, yeah, identity is so problematic, I think, for those of us who are from more than one place, who have more than one ethnicity um, in all sorts of ways. Um, and so I'm going to finish with a really, um, a poem that for me feels kind of nostalgic. The, the title of it, and it's a, a, a Malay expression, um, means literally to go back to your village, but it has a sense of going home, you know, to, to go back to the place you were born, where, where you're from, your identity. Um, and for me, that's just something for all sorts of reasons I, I will never, never be able to do. Um, it's called Balet Kampong. When I return, I want it to be this. Father in a sarong and t-shirt, walking the five foot way, calling on shopkeepers in his mouth full of dialects. And the evening shopping done, reaching for my sticky hand and crossing to our Ford Escort. 
But I look back over my shoulder. A child stands at the verge, staring at the rush hour traffic, with proton sagas and lorries in an unending rattling roar. And there is no one left to take her anxious hand. Thank you. Wow, that was that was incredible, Nita. Can we all please give her a round of applause for that? Um, I want to start with a poem that really celebrates my mom, my poor um, mother who had to kind of live with us in Malaysia. It is Mother's Day in Hong Kong, so this is to you, mom, um, if you're listening. So this is called White Woman. Or, as we whispered round corners behind her back, Orang Pote, giggling incessantly and tracking her through markets, concealed in our slick slacks and slippers, while she, more modestly clad, rustled by. Folk greeted her with curved smiles while kids fumbled arms beside her, shocked at the contrast of her colour. The coolie boys balked and stared at their tawny skin, pubescent sweat tanning them daily in the heat. The Malay women cooed their rhythm. Missy, you buy, you buy, holding up lush mangosteen, rambutan, in full outstretched hands, pleading smiles, but only to thumb proudly at her back. Ya, orang putih, come by from me. Once, falling over myself, I gored my own knee open, and there she was, a crisp white hanky, ready to daub the shame from all those anxious looks. I froze as she cupped her fi my face with soft palms, reluctant, staring up, at mother's face. So the poem really turns on the idea of, um, you know, this, this kind of very isolated white woman who later appears to be our mother. And kind of playing on this idea of, of race and misogyny is, is really one of the things that runs quite um, consistently through the volume. There's another poem that I have from childhood which I'd like to share because I think it works quite well with a later poem that I'll share with you. And this is called School Parade. And what it does is it, it kind of foregrounds some of the national day celebrations that take place in Malaysia, where they kind of celebrate the end of British rule. And of course, having a mixed, um, you know, mixed heritage, it's always interesting to think about how you deal with these um, declarations of, of nationalism. School Parade. In the Padang, Morning sweat glistening on our brows, eyes squinting devilishly at our national sun. We sang our hearts out of tune as the flags rose solemnly above our heads to clutter up the skies. First, the national, state, then school anthem, all blurred into one long song which tapered off with the principal sonorous drone as monitors leered at us from the back and mosquitoes tagged us on the rank fields. Throughout August, we learned of Merdeka, how the British were fought and overthrown by all our patriotic forefathers. I too yelled death to the invaders, then bit my tongue for fear of home reprisals. I wanted to fly kites or thrash marbles, but as the celebrations gathered storm, there was no let up. Shirts were inspected, shoes acquired spit, and we scuffled round the field, chained together in one labor. Such songs I would never forget, such pomp, the way trumpets blundered through untrained ears, our heads chasing madness, each with eyes fixed on the distance, conspiring to evade service to school and its oppressive rule. So that, that kind of experience of, of growing up in, in, in Malaysia, going to a, a very, very mixed school, but also being forced or funneled rather into this nationalist discourse, it, it really kind of becomes a, an important um, way of representing myself in this volume. And what I have moving into the second section is a similar experience where I go to the Malaysian High Commission in London 
uh, and I'm forced to deal with this, this idea of having to choose my allegiance to a particular nation state. And of course, it's never as easy as that. It's always more complicated because you have to deal with some of the politics of association um, that come with that. So the next poem I have is called 45 Belgrave Square. It's one of the more popular poems in the collection, um, and it really plays on some of the nationalist images that we associate with with England um, but also with with Britain and Empire more generally. 45 Belgrave Square. We waited under the buzz of a rotating fan, sheets neatly printed against palms, waiting for my annual summons to citizenship. Dad led the way preceding me by 30 years toil under a hot tropical sun as we sat under the crescent gaze of a woman with sharp brows and the glorious headscarf striped across her forehead. Passports were handed back awaiting stamps of approval and the tentative claim to become native again lasted well into the day. Flicking through serried pages of childhood exploits with no visible history, she looked deep beneath my skin and see, you don't have the right stamp. Round eyes met almond eyes, and the pegs didn't fit, which meant I was an illegal in England unless you have a British passport, she glowered, blue and white asterisks overlapping her bloodshot eyes. Despite our heavy protests, my rights to Malaysia were revoked and I became alien to this colonial enclave in an ex-colonial empire. Under the whirring fan, I saw my childhood sucked out of this dual existence, leaving me dry from the orange-tipped sunsets that tasted of innocence and the luscious peel of mango that shriveled up like a disused tongue fruit sagging by the lull of evening. Attendant now in my own country, I retraced my way back into a realm inherited by English hordes and partisans bereft of nationhood and civility. As we limped down Trafalgar, a sudden shadow threw its full length across my path. Nelson himself stood proud across my brow, signaling do or die invites and hailing his newest recruit to hoist the colours. Some familiar line from an old textbook gripped me as he flashed a crooked grin. The lesson of an age struck from me long ago. How England expects every man to do his duty. How truly mankind is press ganged into service. So that's quite an important poem both for me personally and within the collection because it basically signals my, my loss of Malaysian um, citizenship. Um, but what it also does is allows me to really deal um, at a more deeper level with the politics of association, but also of misogyny, thinking about how we deal with this concept of, of race, ethnicity, and how we try to mediate this within our own very, very um, complicated and also sometimes quite fragile ego. So the next poem that I have is called Mutant. And what it does is it really it turns this idea of misogyny into some kind of superpower, as it were. Mutant. Forged by the world, but not of it. I am that most composite of creatures, your hybrid monster, chimera whose progeny you never planned. Away from your pregnant furnace, I clang and grip for a second birth. My misshapen figure lies heavy against the metallic faces of this earth. My heat was born on human hands. Now my blood will darken and congeal in embers of desire, then spill, as love does, across distant lands. I am nowhere. I am everywhere. No island is out of reach, no shore too distant. My every breath will slay the horizons. Airborne, I weld myself into arcs of light, 
split the sun's baptismal rays into rainbows. My prismatic gaze has set the world apart and dispersed the teeming multitudes. Resurrected daily, I stand poised above fields, casting myself over borders whose shadows flee with their armies into the night. I have spent an eternity in your myths, always a brief step from home. I wave at that unknown tribe on the margin, shaking loose my ancestors' limbs. No earth I inherit will take me back into its furnace now. Out of my one sun will come a thousand burnished blades. Each child will singe within my flames. So that's a very difficult poem on, on a conceptual level to, to grasp. But what I want to do is I want to play with this idea of, of misogyny being actually everywhere. Uh, and, but also to keep that kind of threatening element, which, which seems to be, um, unfortunately, still a part of race relations across the world. What I want to do is, is I want to kind of, um, I don't know how long I've spent. Jennifer, maybe you can, um, you can chide me if I'm going over time. Is Jennifer there? I'm not sure if we can hear Jennifer. Um, well, doesn't matter. Uh, what I'll do then is I'll read um, probably the final poem, which is the last um, but one in the collection. And this really takes things back towards Hong Kong, because even though the collection is not in any way about Hong Kong, it's very much um, the, the kind of mise-en-scene, the invisible mise-en-scene. Um, because I wrote almost all of these poems when I moved to Hong Kong after graduating from the UK. So I wanted to finish with this pivot back to China, as it were, because I think it's important for me to, to continue my writing um, about Hong Kong, China, about the East Asia region. So this one is called Dragons Rising, and you can probably guess it's about the, uh, the big fat dragon in the room. They come flying across azure skies, straddling great earthenware hills, paddling out of sunken depths and rousing eyelids from stumps of trees. Like great rivers, their torsos writhe and coil at every bend. Under each crevice, beside each faint shadow, they emerge from all the elements to speak to me. The greatest amongst them are flanked by crab-nosed guards from brittle glass palaces who will order me to pay them homage with my hornless head hung low and my claws sheathed and bowed. I must pray for their benevolence, always obedient, never pleading for them to turn their gaze from me. They will hold me fast in their embrace, like a prodigal son newly returned whisper at origins beyond the eastern seas and lash their tails across great continents, eager to measure their momentous tides with their old age wisdom and their charm, expecting to see their offspring running back in droves before their immortal eyes. They tell me, I too can pass through this arched gateway to heavenly peace, that my scales will glisten with pride again, spewing up great mouthfuls of smoke. They tell me everything has changed. Yi shi long de chuan ren, they say, stretching their gleaming talons behind their backs. You belong to us now. Okay, so my quote is this. Um, I recently joined the uh, uh, Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong Bee Resituate. Um, competition and this film got first place there. It's this competition for undergraduate students. It's called Yellow Stains in Chinese Blue. It is impolite to wake the dying, silvery mouth tie on their lips. You were taught to love the oak. They love Mao and vote blue. Can you love them still? Too yellow for your Chinese skin said Ye Ye, chopping peppercorns, her sent a reminder of the thirds, tear gassed bits. Your Chineseness is a broken traffic light, 
the spray paint in your bloodline. Yellow your skin, yellow your heart, yellow your ribbon too. That day you were dreaming. To your father's face you lied. This gaze a meteorite. We feel you. Same hall you first kissed Anna in as a slate of bean backgrounds. How are you supposed to feel when the 12 year old hands you a brick? Mm -hmm. We fall in place for our daily bread. Cameras as our outer boys. Oh, did you hear his name? You locked your dreams in a slip-lock bag, far away from your Chinese eyes. Must press on curb, blood stains rich as your mother's love. You look at the full face mask again. So Huang Di's child, how do you explain the cockroaches too have dreams? Thank you. Wow, very, very, very powerfully um, brought across as well, Felix. Can we give him a round of applause for that? <clears throat> um, Felix, do you want to do you want to explain to some of our um, some of our viewers what yellow and blue mean in this context? Yes. Okay, so I'm Paola. I'm from Italy and have been uh, in Asia for quite a long time. And um, so obviously, I'm also torn in between two realities my uh, motherland and uh, Hong Kong or Asia, where I lived. I live also in Singapore for seven years. Um, so uh, today I'm going to read a poem that is um, quite a, a big metaphor about how I feel about the two countries and also um, the expectation that we always have when we go to a new place uh, or also towards our own place. So we always try to find the best and we are hoping always to, to, to see the best of everything, right? To have the best experience and so on. So the title of the poem is uh, Pearl and Coral. For you, vertical city, I headed east in search of the pearl concealed in your harbor no longer fragrant with agarwood trees. A pearl slip under the firm carpet of reclaimed lands, the asbestos roofs of shacks, or captured by the mouth of a golden dragon. In a Shamshui Po shop, I was offered mother of pearl buttons for $5 a pair. Iridescent, gleaming, made of the same nacre as pearl, but not formed, patiently layer upon layer within a soft body tissue, rather in the inner lining of hard shells. Two, for you, motherland, I dream west. I collected postcards, their stamps now yellow, and then screensavers, ritualistic fantasies for coffee breaks, sunset intensely red, shots of the ruins that made your history, whitewashed walls, paint, stains, muscular statues of naked gods, gothic pinnacles and Romanesque arches. I could smell pine trees, touch dolomite rocks. I could swim in turquoise water, but didn't scout the rocky sea bottom, didn't explore caverns and crevices 300 meters below, to find your coral. I skimmed the surface, wearing goggles. In the stall near St. Mark Square, I was once offered bracelets of polished red glass beads for five euros a pair. Three, Hong Kong, motherland. With you, I feel like a hopeful bride, wishing a pair ring for engagement and coral earrings for the wedding day. Thank you. Hold on, Paula. Uh, the poem I'm going to read is called uh, The Summer Critter Speaks Not of Frost, uh, Ha Chong Ba Hao Yu Bing. And uh, usually when people talk about um, the summer cre creature, you know, does not, the summer critter does not speak of frost, they're talking about um, someone. They're they're talk they're telling people not to not to convince someone or try to persuade someone of something they wouldn't understand, and I'm sort of turning that idea on the head and trying to uh, fit it into the idea of someone who suffers uh, uh, from 
from uh, mental health issues, um, trying to uh, get them to view the world or um, normality as it is, is um, a very a very big task for them and it's, it's almost damn near impossible. So um, this is the poem. The summer critter speaks not of frost. Ha chong ba hao yu bing. Do not trespass with perhaps. Do not ponder why the brief critter sheds its days like that. That summer is more of a reprieve than trapping home. That it will try and try and not find the word for frost. That it does not know at all that the world can stay colder than fire, which is torrid, that you can even drown in the intolerable light. In its dreams, white is a figment, and melting is but a tributary of perishable air. I will be lost. I will be impossible. Spent like an envelope singing my eyes shut, always forgetting, always. This duet, a starved type of blue. Thank you. Wow, wonderful. Let's give Rachel a round. That is, of course, Dino Mahoney. Dino, do you have a poem for us? Yeah, hi, Jason. Thank you. Uh, this poem's called Year of the Ox. It's um, about visiting my husband's uh, family for dinner during uh, Hong Kong, uh, the Chinese New Year. Um, they didn't know, typical of mixed gay couples, they didn't know that their son was gay and they didn't know that I was his partner, but they thought I was his friend and I got invited to dinner for um, Chinese New Year's and I wrote this poem about it. Many moons after I'd swapped hearts with their son, we meet in their tiny tower block flat on the third day of the Lunar New Year. The round table we sit at fills the entire space he grew up in. His mother chats in Cantonese, father stirs an iron wok. Dishes land in a rush, mapo tofu, butterfly prawns, crispy beef, boiled rice, chopsticks spring, feast begins. After sipping Johnny Walker, I leaf through his logbook. Shanghai, Rio, Cape Town, London, Hamburg, Rotterdam. And there it ends. Something must have shown. The way I looked at their son was too much at home. Ooh, very good. Great ending. That's, that's, fun. that's wonderful. And what was it, what, if you don't mind me asking, what was the result of, of what happens after the poem? I didn't see them for, until they got sick for a long time, years. Oh, but God. then uh, when the mother got sick, I think they realized that we were a couple, but they didn't want to acknowledge it openly. But a meeting was arranged through the brother and we, we met and it was amicable. And although we didn't talk about it openly, they showed me kindness and acceptance and I showed them kindness and acceptance. So, so it was nice. Okay. Well, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of times, you know, we want to get as many out loud as we're not in Hong Kong to come back to out loud in Hong Kong. Okay, after, after Dina, I think we have um, a new reader, um, Jenny, Jenny Pagdin. Um, who has also recently published a pamphlet from Iwe. Um, would you like to just introduce yourself very briefly and, and tell us about your poem? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, I'm based in England. Uh, as you said, I published uh, with Iwe three years ago, which is a poem about postnatal psychosis. And most of my writing is to do with mental illness and mental health. Um, but this poem's not. I really like the phrase that you've been using a, a hyphenated identity. It's Jennifer's um, phrase, yeah. Um, sorry? It's Jennifer's sorry, phrase. It's, it's I like Jennifer it, Jenny. Phrase, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that my uh, background is hyphenated, um, although I've been brought up in a pretty English way, and I usually find that I lose that hyphenation or complexity in other people's eyes, which is a privilege, but it can also leave me a little wistful. 
So this poem is um, exploring an identity and it's called Before the Market Town with a Pepper Pot Building. Before the market town with the pepper pot building and the concrete bus station and its standing water, we were Hampshire, Beirut and Freetown with neat shelves of Vimto, Ivory, Mylupa, of Milton, tie-dyes, pink almonds and sugar cane. I picture my poor legs straddling the continents and note that I came missing certain accessories, my birthright languages, my dowry earrings, my baptismal faith, etiquette, history and certainty of acceptance. I was born into do well, say grace, press your clothes, into an English market town, walking wolf fleeces and selwood commutes, where the girls drink spritzes and the men pints. And I've tried, I've tried to leave. Thank you. Wow, that's wonderful. Is, would you want, do you want to say a little bit more about the poem? Um, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of lines that suggest location, but we don't know what those locations are. Sure. So, um, it's, it's a uh, Where I Come From poem, which is a very popular, uh, you know, workshop idea. Um, my uh, dad is English and my mum is Lebanese, but born um, into West Africa, Sierra Leone. So Hampshire, Beirut and Freetown. And then the lists of things on the shelves all bring together that um, uh, the influence of living in Africa and the... Um, influence also of uh, Lebanese culture. So these would be things that I would see in my relatives home mm. as, a, as a child. Um, uh, it, it, the poem is also about split identity of hometown. So um, I grew up in High Wycombe, which is in southeast England, but um, now live in Norwich, a city I much prefer. And so I've always had quite harsh feelings towards Wycombe. And that's why I'm trying to leave it in the poem. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. Yeah, yeah I, have, 